<laughs> you waited all day to say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, practice. Yeah. yeah, so Peter is a professor. Okay, thank you. So every time I hear one of Jan's extremely convincing talks, I feel kind of bad. I think I should really face reality more. Um, and so here is one attempt of reconciling my interest in verification and facing reality. Um, the reality that I'm trying to face in this work, and this is, by the way, a joint work with two of my PhD students uh, who are on vacation today in Greece instead of sweating with us here, um, is is that many people who build static code checkers, say a static program verifier or a static analyzer, deliberately decide to make their checkers unsound in order to optimize some other qualities. For instance, in order to optimize automation, verifiers that are sound often need more annotations from the programmer than if you're willing to ex uh, accept some unsoundness. Uh, or to improve performance, because you can maybe use a simpler static analysis, or to increase precision uh, by reporting fewer false positives for the price of some false negatives. Uh, just to give you uh, examples of the kinds of unsoundnesses that I have in mind here, so here are some of the things that many tools out there do. So for instance, many tools assume that certain pieces of code have only certain side effects, only certain write effects, but not others. So for instance, uh, tools like ESC Java or uh, the, the verifier for, Havoc called, uh, for C called Havoc use modifies clauses like we have seen in uh, Muli's talk this morning, but they don't check them. So they just bli blindly trust the programmer that when the programmer writes down a modifies clause, it actually specifies the right effect of a procedure. Um, or for instance, uh, the .NET static analyzer Clouseau assumes that certain methods don't interfere with the results of certain side effect free methods that the program provides. And this is also just assumed, not checked. Another area is arithmetic. So many tools assume that there's unbounded, unbounded arithmetic and don't consider um, um, overflow. Uh, like Clouseau is one of them, ESC Java, the SpecSharp verifier is one of them. There's a long list actually. A third example is loop unrolling. So for instance, just to give another example, um, Corel, which used to be called Poirot, uses some form of stratified inlining and only analyzes a bounded number of uh, loop iterations. Or ESC Java uh, decided back then to analyze only one and a half loop iterations for every loop, which means you look at one entire uh, iteration and then you evaluate the guard once more and then you stop basically. Um, and many tools use unsound heap abstractions, like for instance the, uh, the Clouseau checker assumes that whenever you look at the input state of a method, each argument points to a disjoint memory region, so there's no aliasing between the arguments. Um, some some um, points to analysis assume uh, that there's no point arithmetic, and so on and so on. So I could continue this for a long time. People ignore exceptional control flow, people ignore reflection. So there are many properties that people decide not to handle soundly in order to optimize some of these other qualities. Okay, so here's an example that I will use throughout the talk to illustrate my idea. So this is written in some like Java or C-sharp uh, style notation. So I have a class cell which has an integer v here, and I have a method that takes two cells. I have preconditions that require that the two cells are both non-null and the values are non-zero. Okay? And I promise as a post condition that the result of the method will be negative. So what I'm going to do here is I compare if the signs of the two values are the same. If so, I change the sign of one of them by multiplying it with minus one, and then I return the product of the two values. So the reasoning is that um, after that if statement, c.v and d.v will have different signs, and therefore when I multiply them, I get a negative result. Okay? But that code is, uh, is of course buggy, and I'm sure you've spotted some of the bugs. So one bug, for instance, is that this multiplication might overflow, and even though you have different signs here, you might in the end end up with a positive result. And also this multiplication by minus one could actually overflow. Right? Just imagine, for instance, that c.v is min value. And we have a third bug here, which might be a bit more difficult to spot. So if c and d happen to be aliases, happen to point to the same cell object, 
then we do not change the sign of one value here, but actually we change the sign of both values. So we turn both from, say, positive to negative, and again, my multiplication here will return a positive result. Okay, so there are three bugs in this tiny method, uh, and when we run Clouseau, uh, for instance, on, on this method, Clouseau will analyze the code and report zero bugs. So you get uh, a result that this code is actually correct within the limits of Clouseau. The reason is that Clouseau ignores overflow, and it also has this unsound heap abstraction, so it assumes that C and D will always point to different objects. As soon as you violate that assumption, um, you get an unsound result here. Okay, so what is the consequence of that? Well, obviously, the consequence of being unsound is that you might miss bugs. That's the obvious result. But there's a second result, which is more a soft engineering problem. Um, if you work in a project and you run a static analyzer, then it's very useful to get some warnings and to fix some problems. But once you stop getting new interesting error messages, it's unclear how to deal with the situation. You don't know what you have actually achieved. And in particular, you don't know what remains to be tested, what kind of quality level do you have in your code now. And that's exactly the problem that we are trying to address here. So our approach is the following. What we would like to do is, we would like to make the program checker, the verifier or analyzer, aware of all its unsound compromises. Okay, so we assume, we only look at, at unsoundnesses that are built into the tool as a design decision. I'm not talking about bugs in the implementation of the verifier. Right? I'm talking about a design that we don't check particular properties. And this happens typically in two cases. Either verifiers make unsound assumptions, like the multiplication won't overflow, or verifiers just simply don't check certain properties at all, like the modifies clauses in Havoc or ESC Java. So what we are doing here is we are going to document these things explicitly. So when we run a verifier on a piece of code, a part of the output will be an instrumented piece of code that contains all this information. So in particular, that code <coughs> contains information about which properties have been checked and which properties have not been checked. And moreover, for everything that has been checked, we document under which assumption that code has been checked. Okay? And so uh, it turns out that we can use a fairly simple language extension to document these things. And then I will show you in my talk how we can use this information and later on uh, for integrating different tools. So let's start with this language uh, extension. How can we document assumptions and verification results? So we document assumptions by introducing a simple clause into our programming language, which is like a Go statement of the form assumed PSA, where P is the property that gets assumed, uh, so an assertion in our assertion language, and A is a fresh variable. So when we have a modular verification approach, um, A can be a fresh local variable. If we deal with global uh, verification, this would have to be a new global variable and that variable A gets initialized to, to true initially. The semantics of such an assumed statement corresponds to an assignment. So that basically means whenever we see this ghost operation, what really happens is we say A gets A and P, which means we accumulate the assumptions that we make at this program point here. So again, when we have modular verification, the only place where this A and matters is if the assumption occurs within a loop. Otherwise, a simple assignment A gets P would be enough. But of course, for a global analysis, you might run over the same assumption many times, um, and so you need this conjunction there. So this is how we record what the verifier assumed in various places. Um, and here are two examples that show what we can encode there. For instance, for unbounded arithmetic, like here v gets x times y, we would say that we assumed that the bounded multiplication of x times y is equal to the unbounded multiplication. And we give that thing a name, a. Or for loop unrolling, we can easily uh, change the code a tiny bit to express this one and a half loop iterations of ESC Java. We just unroll the loop once here. And afterwards, we say, okay, the, the verifier assumed here that from now on C is false. Okay, and now that means we just run through C one more time and then we have assumed that the loop terminates. Which means when you run the program, you still get the same behavior as before, right? We didn't change the operational behavior of the program but we uh, recorded uh, that the verification, in this case ESC Java, made a particular assumption. It did not check any other uh, runs here. So now, uh, the second extension that we need is we need to record for every assertion under which assumptions it has been verified. 
And we do that by adding this uh, set V here. So a V is a set of set of assumpt assumption variables. Basically, every element in this set V stands for one verification attempt. So when you run your verifier on the method or on the program once, you will add one element to V, and that element is a set of assumption variables, all the assumptions you made in order to prove P. Okay? So that means the semantics of this uh, slightly extended assertion is basically that we introduce and assume, in, in the sense of a guarded command statement, and assume before the assert, and here is the case where V has exactly one element, capital A. So what we assume is that if all the assumptions for one run of the verifier hold, then we have already showed P. Okay, this is what our verifier guarantees, that when the assumptions actually hold, then P also holds. Okay, and then it remains to show P under this assumption. And if you have many runs of your verifier, so if V contains many elements, you take the disjunction of all of them. So if you say if there is one run among the many runs where all the assumptions hold, then that's enough to assume P for the rest of the verification. So, so putting this V here essentially weakens our assertion by giving this assumption for, for further reasoning. So again, here's a, a small example. So this is the, the case where we have modifiers clauses that are used but not checked. Um, so the method that has a modifiers clause here would at the end have an assertion uh, which encodes the meaning of the modifiers clause. So for every location OF, either the location is in the modifiers clause or its value didn't change. And we express the fact that the verifier, say Havoc, ignores this, um, this proof obligation by simply not putting an element into this V set. And if V is the empty set, then the assumption that we get here is false on the left, so overall we have not gained any information. Okay, so let's go back to our running example. So here's the running example with the encoding for the way Clouseau analyzed the program. So we have three assumptions here. First of all, Clouseau assumed that in the input state here, uh, the parameters C and D are different. So that's my first assumption A1 here. Moreover, it assumed for the multiplication that we don't have an overflow. I showed you earlier how to encode this, and that's my assumption A2. And for the other multiplication, we have the same thing, and that's my assumption A3. And then Clouseau can emit one of these sets here uh, in, my, in the assertion for the post condition, so I can say I've verified the post condition uh, using one verification attempt, and in that verification attempt, I used A1, A2, and A3. So if all those three assumptions hold, the method is correct, but if, if one of them is violated, it might not be correct. Okay, so what does that buy us? Well, the, most, uh, or, or the first thing that that gives us is that now um, the verification results capture precisely what the static checker achieved. It's no longer the situation that we get no longer additional warnings and we don't know what we've achieved. Now we know precisely what we, what we know about the program and what we don't know. So what you could even do is you could prove a soundness result for an unsound checker, right? You could say for every run in which all the assumptions that you make hold, um, the program is actually correct if it verifies. So you can, you, can, uh, you can start reasoning about an unsound verification. But the most important uh, reason for us why we are interested in that is that now we can start combining several uh, probably complementary analyzers and checkers and run them on the same code and let them uh, make use of each other's results. Um, so the idea is basically the following. When you run a static checker, we would add such V elements to the assertions and those translate into assumptions which effectively weaken the proof obligation. Right? So a second checker doesn't have to check P, it only has to check that either all the assumptions of the previous checker hold, or if that's not the case, then P nevertheless holds. So the second checker gets a weaker proof obligation than the first one, and the third one gets a weaker proof obligation than the second one. So that gives you a way of combining several static checkers and letting them uh, benefit from each other's verification attempts. But that's not the, f yeah, Jan? Oh yeah, we get to that, yeah. So the second thing you can do now is you can, you can, um, <laughs> you can use this information 
uh, instrument your code using a runtime checker, and then what we do with this runtime checker is we, we use that as input to a test case generator and try to test exactly those cases that have not been statically checked. So here's the way we do that. So this is the example again in its original form, and we ran the uh, concolic testing tool PEX for .NET on that. And if you run PEX on this code, and PEX understands contracts, so if you run PEX on that code, it will detect the aliasing errors. It will give you a test case where C and D are aliased and you find a bug. However, it will not show you the overflow errors. The main reason for that is that PEX goes after branch coverage, and once you have managed to violate this assertion once, that branch is covered, right? And it does not try to find more or different test cases, different ways of violating the same assertion. So that's not a nice, uh, a nice situation because now you need to fix the bug, run it again, detect uh, a related bug, fix it, run it again, and so on. It would be nicer to get like all the, uh, the errors together. So let me see, let, let me show how we do that with our instrumentation. So this is again the code that you've seen before, the example with the instrumentation um, for, the, for the run of Clouseau. And now we turn these assumed statements into runtime checks, basically. So what's happening here is we turn the preconditions into assumed statements, like, like, like uh, normal, right? We uh, really treat the assumed statements as assignments. And I omitted the A1 and here because we don't have loops, so this is uh, just a simpler form. Um, another uh, such assignment here, a third assignment here, and then here's the assumption that comes from the verification result. So if all three conditions hold, we know the post condition holds. Then this is the check for the post condition, and here we return. Okay, and now we can feed that into, uh, into PEX. I mean, for this particular example, we had to tweak PEX a little bit to make it understand how to handle big integers for the overflow thing, but that's, that's trivial because the underlying theorem prover, of course, knows how to do that. Um, so when we do that, we do find the aliasing problem like before, so we, we still catch that error, but now we also catch both overflow errors. Okay, so now we really find all three problems with this, with this code. So why is that? So one, one reason why we get that is that this assumption here, when you, so, so PEX works, works on the bytecode level, and when you translate conjunction and disjunction, uh, in the non-strict form in bytecode, of course, you get lots of branches, right? Because you, you want to uh, implement the shortcut operators there. So you get more branches, and PEX tries to cover those branches because it goes after branch coverage. So it will actively look for inputs that violate the assumptions that Clouseau has made. Uh, but I think the more important reason why this is an improvement for testing is that by having this assumption here, we get a stronger path condition during the symbolic execution, which means we narrow down the search space for the constraint solver. And that's important because that means the constraint solver will first go after the values that Clouseau did not consider. So now if you had infinite time for testing, that wouldn't really matter. But in practice, you would test with a given time budget, right? So you're really interested in hitting the interesting cases first and the non-interesting cases later. And this assumption here really focuses the, the search in the symbolic execution on the interesting cases, those that have not been verified yet. Okay, that's the one, one advantage that we get out of having this instrumentation for testing. There's another advantage. Uh, it turns out that when you run verifiers or static analyzers on, on just normal object-oriented code, there are actually lots of methods that you can verify completely without making any assumptions, that you can really soundly verify, uh, because you have lots of getters and simple functions that don't require any sophisticated reasoning. So to demonstrate that, we wrote a, a very little um, implementation here. It's a, it's a linked list with a total of 12 operations. And we simulated an experiment by taking the Daphne verifier, which uh, does not make such unsound compromises. It might be unsound because of bugs, but by design, it's supposed to be sound. And we made it unsound by just adding command line switches that introduce certain unsound behavior so that we have full control over what's going on. And then with this unsound version of Daphne, we try to verify um, in, in different constellations this uh, implementation, and it turns out that out of those 12 methods, eight of them, the green ones here, were always soundly verified. Uh, three of them were never soundly verified, and one depended on, 
on which unsound assumptions we introduced. So more precisely, we used the sound verification of Daphne, but with a time limit of two hours. So the PhD student who ran the experiment did not want to spend more than exactly two hours on trying to get the verification through. And after two hours, she had nine out of 12 methods, and those three methods were missing. And the other three cases actually have unsound assumptions here. Uh, we used unbounded integer arithmetic, we used the unsound loop unrolling, and the combination of the two. And you see, I mean, this is just a small experiment. It's, it's not, not really an evaluation in that sense, but it's a, it's a, it hints in the direction that we might actually see a benefit here because in all four cases, we get a test reduction by roughly 60%. Okay, so we need to generate smaller test suites to still cover all the cases that the verifier has not covered yet. Okay, so we get a more targeted search and we get smaller test suites. We get overall a more effective test suite. So let me summarize. Um, so what we propose is to, uh, to make verification results with explicit assumptions explicit in the code. And it turns out that for the kinds of verifiers that we've considered, these two simple annotations are sufficient to express the properties that we would like to express. Um, and the big advantage is that now we get a definite answer out of our program checker. It's not just, well, I tried my best and these are the, the warnings that I got. We can say precisely what has been checked and what hasn't been checked. Uh, and that's really here the basis for the tool integration. And then I showed you specifically how to integrate it with testing. And here our experiments show, uh, and we have done many more cases than the ones that I talked about here, of course, that the combination of the two actually finds more errors than testing alone. So we really outperform PEX uh, without our instrumentation. And we get smaller and more targeted, more focused test suites. And I think besides these results, uh, I think there's also a major practical benefit for, for an engineer because now we have the, the freedom to basically decide how much effort we want to invest into verification. So it's no longer like an all or nothing decision. Do I want to go for formal ver verification all the way to the end or not? You can basically say, I'm going to spend two hours, like in our example here, I will record which assertions I was able to prove in these two hours and whatever remains will be covered by the test case generation. So you, you also get this benefit of having this freedom uh, to, to fine tune the effort you want to invest. Uh, so we are still very actively working on that. So what's currently happening is that we are expressing all the unsoundnesses of Clouseau, and there are many, um, in our framework. And so far that was possible. So we are in, uh, in very close contact to the developers of Clouseau um, who are very helpful in explaining to us what kind of unsound assumptions they make. And it's also very interesting for them because they are not always sure which behaviors are actually sound and which aren't sound. So this discussion, I think, helps both sides. And so we expect that uh, in a couple of weeks, we really have this tool, tool chain running and covering all the ways in which Clouseau makes these simplifying assumptions. And uh, that's all for now. I'm happy to take your questions. Right? I mean, I know that the people from, from MSR already have a hard time convincing Visual Studio to accept their tools. I'm not sure how much luck I will have as an outsider. Um, I would certainly hope for this kind of impact, but I cannot say whether this is realistic or not. Uh, so you said that basically when you're running the verifiers, you're collecting the, the assumptions and the basically things which you have proven, you can feed it to the, another verifier and go like this. So you said that the first verifier has fewer information than the second one, basically. So do you run this basically until you reach a fixed point, or do you just run it on all the verifiers that it? Or so what, what we do right now is we just accumulate elements in this V-set, right? And, and so currently we don't have a check whether all those elements together eventually mean that you have like sound verification of this assertion. So we imagine this would just work via an extra pass to the method where you just take those assumptions, feed them into the, uh, into the theorem prover, and just ask the theorem prover whether this is equivalent to true. But we don't do that yet, but this is how we imagine doing that. Yeah, but you could basically know the assumptions. No, um, but I think actually it would be, 
a good exercise also for the developer of a verifier to, to, to write down what their unsound assumptions are. I think, for instance, for... We do that in the field, then. <laughs> I agree. So, um, so Ben Lipschitz gave this talk uh, at PLDI about soundiness, right? Where he said, "Well, let's finally admit that we all build unsound tools, uh, and and that's that as a community, let's go away from false soundness <laughs> claims with papers, and instead just say, okay, we are soundy, meaning we are sound, modulo all the obvious things that nobody knows." Uh, so maybe such a like uh, uh, such a step in the community is necessary. I mean, I've built a few verifiers, and the largest one is SpecSharp. And I think for SpecSharp, I do know precisely what the unsoundnesses are. I don't know about the implementation bugs. There might be many, but I think I know precisely in the design where I made unsound assumptions. And if I had a way to record that, I, I believe that people, when they build a verifier, they know what they're doing. Maybe two years later, they don't know exactly anymore what they assume here or there. But if they had a way of just recording that right away, it might help them. Yeah. Right. So what, the only thing that I can say is that so far we our experiments are limited to modular verifiers for sequential code. Uh, for those, we found properties that were hard to express, but none that were impossible to express. It basically depends on how much instrumentation as go state are you are you willing to accept. So, for instance, for checking something like effect checking. Um, we, we start keeping track of read effects and write effects. We carry around sets of objects in our go state and so on. So if you're willing to accept that, then so far we could ex express everything, but for instance for concurrency we have no answer whatsoever. So then yeah. There's another approach that you might be making. Let your tool produce the, 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 the formal tool. So for example, spec sharp, it uses V3, you can let V3 speak the tool. And then you can so then you don't rely on the on the on the go. And then it's third program, but it's exactly what you want to do. Right, you could yes, that's something you could do. Um this however this is how you can combine two uh, full tools. You just combine the two tools if they they are in the same format. I think it's not that easy, right? I mean typically typically what you have is that between Say the operation semantics of the of the program and the verification con condition you generate, you might have a complicated methodology, and that methodology has like complex sound as proofs and so on. And and this gives you a gap, right? I mean, you cannot just take the verification condition and the operation semantics and expect them to match. I mean, very few verifiers. I agree, but I think your 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 approach is also very difficult. Oh yeah, because, because yeah, not. Once you think you're complicated, it's really really hard to actually write it. And I'm not even sure, I mean, you said it's your assumptions are sound, but I think they are very far from being complete. And it's just a lot of time, actually, the tool will be correct even though these assumptions are, are not there. Right, but the, I, I, I mean, you're, you're right with everything that you're saying, but I think the advantage that you would not get out of this producing a certificate in the prover is getting this instrumentation for testing, right? So. Well, uh, actually, this you can do too, because you can be able to say, no, I don't, I don't agree. You are more divided. You have the proof. And now you can see what are the things which are not proven and use them as a, as a mechanism to mutate, like, like you know, for test, one of the beauties of the approach for testing is mutation testing. Yeah. You can now say, take the tool and try to mutate the problem and show that all the things which are not proven are wrong. In fact, you have more information. Mm -hmm. Sure, this information now is, is used, occupied, the things that it produces. We have not considered that, but I will think about that. Any more questions? Okay, so let's thank Peter again. So I guess that's it for today. Um, we will